welcome into Price Out the Podcast. I'm Andrew Morgan, and I'm in here with your gracious and beautiful host, Cornelius Swartz. See, I had to throw you for a loop because you were looking so serious. So I had that, to that, throw that, some good words out there. That was a loop and a half. I went all the way around the room on that one. We don't have to keep it. You know, we don't have to keep it. No, no, no. Okay. It, we should make that the intro every time. Gracious and beautiful. <laughs> Mostly just beautiful, I think, yeah. is um no. yeah. All right. So today we've got a really uh we've got a really great show from a uh Q and A session you did at UMass, correct? Yeah, UMass Boston. We do these Q and A's all the time for universities and professional development groups, uh and other screenings that happen in other parts of the country where I just kind of Skype in for a Q&A after the show, uh, like, for example, places like UMass, but also in Nashville and Atlanta, um, places where they hear about the film just from word of mouth, and uh, they come to us and ask to either do a screening or purchase a DVD, and I, I just talk to the group afterwards. So this was um, a school that actually my daughter attends, and so she was in the audience, um, and we spoke with a housing activist who, well, she's not an activist, she works at a community development corporation that's doing work in Boston. She's got a lot of expertise. So you're going to hear from myself, uh, from the professor, uh, Tracy Beard, who is in the uh, graduate program there in the School of Equity and Inclusion. And we're just going to be talking about the issues in Boston. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So we, we went ahead and kind of uh, started a little bit of the discussion um, about the film and kind of what's happening um, in and around Boston uh, concerning um, gentrification and uh, we're recording this as well. So just so you know, like the whole conversation is being uh, recorded um, for, for that. But um, I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit about kind of your um, kind of your process so like in the film like you you not only share the stories of like the story of Nikki uh, but you also shared your uh, personal story of displacement and kind of how uh, has your personal experience experiences with displacement kind of shaped your views about gentrification since the first film that you that you filmed has there been any changes or were there any changes uh, according to that. Well, you know, you know, in the film, we try to make a distinction between housing as an issue or housing displacement, economic displacement, and cultural displacement. And so, you know, my experiences with, you know, being uh, evicted um, or displaced or being priced out mostly from, from other cities that I've lived in and couldn't afford to stay in, um, you know, I was in Portland because it was the most affordable place the, that I that I could be in. Um, but you know, though those are I was never in any kind of real threat. Though I mean, I'd been displaced, but um, I never felt like I was going to be homeless or um, that I was going to be in a situation where I was going to be very very unstable or um, that I, I just wouldn't be able to pay for food or have to skip meals. Um, so, so my experiences were more just about that the housing market can be rough, but it, it wasn't an existential threat. Uh, and, you know, just working on the documentary is just an example of how I, I, I need to not lump myself in the same category as people who are displaced or people who have serious housing insecurity or people who experience you know, cultural displacement. So if anything, it, it just made it clear to me that I was, I was not in the same category and that, you know, my, my problems were not big problems compared to others. And I think you touched on something that was, re that's really important. And we say you can jump in too um, with this particular question, but um, in a recent interview with NPR, uh, Matthew Desmond, the Pulitzer Prize uh, author of Evicted, poverty and profit in the American city. Um, he was quoted as saying is eviction isn't just a condition of poverty, it is a cause of poverty. So if you can kind of talk about, um, and I think you touched on it a little bit, how displacement it causes poverty um, for residents. Yeah, well, I mean, the cost of moving and or, or being moved is tremendous. 
you know, in Evicted, there's, um, it's a tremendous book, um, but there, there's a number of examples of how just being in the cycle of whether that's eviction, uh, relocation, um, or in the criminal justice system, even for a minor offense, you know, the, the, the churn through those, through those systems costs a great deal and creates a great deal of instability in and of itself, you know, uh, so you got to pay first and last month rent. You got to pay moving fees. You got to, you know, take off from work to find a place to live. Um, then you have new transportation costs. Um, your family, you, you know, you might try to keep your kid in the old, in the, the former school so that they're stable, um, which creates new time constraints. Um, so every time you move, you know, that all those costs and all those burdens start, start up again. And if you're living from paycheck to paycheck, um, it can quickly force you into debt. It can force you to be behind in your bills. If you're, you know, late enough on one bill, um, that could ding your credit. Um, or, you know, if you have uh, other assets that you can get leaned on. Um, and so, so these are the things that when you're just barely above water can force you down, um, and for good sometimes. And if you're in the criminal justice system, you know, I've, I mean, I've done reporting on people who owed 120 bucks to Washington County, Oregon, and they wind up doing two years in jail um, because it sets off a chain of events, triggers probation or puts them in debt. Um, and, and it just, it just sends you down, down the river for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And so to add on to that, there are um, so individual health out, um, negative health uh, out outcomes that both moms and children experience because of repeated forced moves. So things like asthma, for example, you wouldn't think about that. But if you're if you're if you're going from poor you know bad building condition to bad building condition, you're going from mold to maybe lead to you know whatever else. I mean. If I, if, if I had more time, I'd show you pictures of some of the buildings of, of, our, of our, our members. Big, big, big hole in the ceiling where you can see the sky. I mean, people are living in conditions like that, like in the winter time, right? And still getting rental increases. I mean, it's unfathomable. So, so you've got these negative individual level health outcomes. But then if you, you look at the, at the, the the, the social and economic cost to a neighborhood. And, you know, Desmond talks about this in his book as well. What happens when, when, when stable, you know, um, social networks leave the block, right? So, so all of the, you know, internal, not policing, but, but, but inter the internal life of a neighborhood gets disrupted. And then you, you don't have the folks who are, who are keeping the peace. You don't have the person on the the elder on the block, you know, keeping an eye on that one and that one. You don't have this woman who's watching these kids because this one has to go to work, right? So, so you have this neighborhood instability, and then you have the economic costs of what happened. You know, how are you going to get people who now live two towns over but still have their still have to go to uh, school or their healthcare provider or their job? So they're so they're they're. So cities are thinking about about you know transportation and health in regional ways because because their customers are literally outside of the city the city limits. Not to mention what happens to a city when you lose afford that housing that was previously affordable, which is like the thing that I keep you know like I'm the broken record. But bad things happen to a city when you lose your affordable housing. Private market and subsidized, yeah. And I think you also talked about, and you, you're touching on a, on a lot of like really important issues as far as like the consequences, not only um, personally for residents, but as a community and, and as a city um, that happened with displacement. Um, and I think the work that you um, are doing at City Life you know, as an activist and advocacy group around anti-displacement, can you kind of talk about uh, some of those uh, things that are happening? Um, and I'm going to start with you, Cornelius, first. You know, what are those movements or um, activist movements that are happening in Portland um, that are 
that people are kind of getting involved in. And I'm particularly interested in kind of arts at activist, you know, movements. Uh, so if there are any, you know, and so there's this pushback between, you know, artists and coming into uh, communities because they are seen as the first wave or the first gentrifiers that come into neighborhoods or they're often sometimes called the creative class. Um, and so uh, communities in LA, like Royal Heights are actively, you know, pushing against, you know, artists and this creative class coming in um, in uh, a form of what they call art washing. Um, so can you kind of talk about if that is happening in Portland or has that happened in, you know, kind of what is the activist or anti-displacement, anti-gentrification activist movement happening there? Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, the, you know, I think the creative class comes in um, like in the last 15 years, but I, I think even the longer sort of history of gentrification, it's, it's not really rooted um, in, in the initial stages or not necessarily rooted in creative class, but more in sort of bohemians, um, meaning like really like intellectuals who are either, you know, living on the fringes or in an alternative sort of social social space um, because they, they might be queer, uh, they might deliberately want to live on the on the edge of society, they've rejected mainstream society. These types of bohemians, we are artists, um, historic preservationists, you know, middle class folks who want to fix up an old Victorian house, um, and then people who are kind of like hermits, like kind of shut-ins and people who don't want to live in mainstream society and and those types of people really characterize the first waves of gentrification that we see throughout america you know starting in the 1960s um when uh, you know greenwich village uh and uh, beacon hill beacon hill was really the first gentrified community in america outside of charleston south carolina and those were largely harvard educated um uh, upper middle class folks who went in there to preserve uh, and restore old housing. So then creative class comes in later when there's really enough sort of graphic designers and web developers out there who made enough money uh, that they could have a real economic impact. And, and that really doesn't happen until the last 10, 10, 15 years, I, I would say. I, don't, I haven't studied it entirely, but even the term creative class is relatively new. Um, so, so Portland and other cities, but Portland was really early on in trying to rebrand itself as, you know, the playground for the creative class, the, the great opportunity for the creative class. And so, so while we had gentrification in Albina, driven by these types of people, of which I was one of them, um, it's really when the creative class sort of lands in Portland, with the millennials come of age with money and skills, that can be ported and imported and exported on the internet rather than they don't have to be in any one particular location, or they can bring their connections in from cities like Boston, New York, Los Angeles, and say, hey, I've got clients in Boston and I could just live in Portland for half the price. Um, might as well just do that. I can do a graphic design job from anywhere. Um, so these people, you know, sort of are really driving uh, amongst other groups, you know, baby boomers retiring, uh, and other people who have legitimate business here because there's a company here that pays them. Um, these are the people who really drive in the housing crisis around the city. The resistance movement from that. So, so has there been a backlash against artists? Not really. Um, you know, it, it, it wasn't gentrified in the sort of the classic like Soho, New York, um, you know, art galleries coming in and, and really kind of disrupting an area very quickly. Um, there were art galleries in some neighborhoods in the black community, but the change was slow. You know, it was that first wave of gentrification and the art galleries were not like high powered art galleries. Nobody was buying a hundred thousand dollar, you know, you know, pickaxe or something out of these types of galleries in Portland. It's small beans here. Um, so, so there wasn't a backlash against, against art washing. Uh, and I haven't seen any here. But um, the resistance movement is 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 very healthy, and it is in the streets. It is you know around people who are you know radical critiques of capital, um, and it is 
it is propelling new leadership to city council. You know, one of our new city councilors um, came in riding a wave of, of street theater, public protest, civil disobedience. She was in the streets with folks and, and she has passed legislation that have probably moved the needle on housing prices and dislocation and displacement more than any single thing that's happened in, in the city in the last 15 years. And, and Portland is leading the way, not, uh, it, not just locally, but is part of the national Homes for All uh, movement that Right to the City is connected to, which is, uh, which is using a trans-local strategy. So, so connecting with, with these, these fiery grassroots base building um, organizations where they are, um, you know, working on both local policy, um, state policy and and then some like sub regional you know sub state policies you know linking all of these disparate um, struggles together into a coordinated national campaign um, that and so so places like Boston is able to draw a lot of inspiration from Tennessee for example or Portland or Rochester which is which has a really incredible rent strike going on right now. Um, against a slum, a kind of a notorious slum landlord. So, so it's really exciting to 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 see, you know, some of the some of that come through for in the, in the film. You know, I I have a question. I'm wondering if you can say more, Cornelius, about your relationship with with the the tenant or the, the tenant movement that we saw in the film. Well, I mean, I, I know the leaders. Um, you know, my my position is uh, as a journalist so you know I, I talk and dialogue with them um, um, that some of them are were interviewed for the film and we didn't wind up you know using any as, as characters but um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm on good terms with them uh, but yeah. I, I don't consider myself an activist yeah yeah awesome thank you and I think um, I think that's really interesting how you in this film use your your positionality to kind of talk about these issues and then you've been very transparent about like where your position is um, as you know a person who is I think in, in the film you say you know hi I'm a gentrifier um, but then also using that positionality um, and using that to kind of work to fight for or bring light to these issues so you know, you may not necessarily, in my opinion, my humble opinion, you may not necessarily be an activist in a, in a traditional sense of the word of being in the street, but I, I would argue that the work that you're doing is, is on, that, on, that, on that strata of being kind of an, at, at least advocating, if not, you know, if activist is a too strong of a term. Um, and I know we're kind of getting kind of late towards the, the end of the evening here. Um, and so I'm going to kind of open up. Do you, does anyone here have any questions for the filmmaker, like for Cornelius? Go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question actually for both Cornelius and Lisa. Um, Cornelius, in the film, you talk about the impact that the right to return, um, was it a bill or an ordinance, had on um, kind of bringing the, the people who had been displaced back to Portland. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about that. And then Lisa, I'm really curious to know if something like that has been used in Boston or could be used in a similar way in Boston. Yeah, um, you know, the, the reference to it in the film is really just that, that they, uh, that the city has adopted a policy of right to return, which uh, I do think is modeled on, on one in New York City. Um, and the policy is just that people who, formerly lived in the neighborhood and they have a criteria for determining that sort of get in line first for housing assistance programs. Now, that's fully three years ago or two and a half years ago that they, they first announced that. And the mayor of Portland just last week blasted this program for being almost completely ineffectual. Um, and and there's there's a number of reasons for that. One is they had a homeowner assistance program that was completely out of touch with the market realities, meaning they were going to give you ten thousand dollars for a down payment on a house where the average you know home price is four hundred to six hundred thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. So you know, no one could take advantage of that. 
Um, they didn't do nearly enough outreach in order to reach people so that they even know that the program's there. They put money or prioritized money to build affordable units from the ground up, which could take, you know, it could take two to three years to get an apartment building through the pipeline in Portland, rather than using the money simply to buy apartment buildings that were already on the market. Mm -hmm. um, and so apartment buildings have been bought and sold, renovated, everyone's been kicked out of them uh, in the whole time frame since this program was supposed to be in effect. Uh, and then they have a home improvement program um, where people can make you know, repairs or fix problems with their houses. And you know, that has probably been one that pe more people have capitalized on it, but I think only about 18 people have capitalized on that, on that program since then. So it's been woefully inadequate. Um, not to say that it's not a good idea, and I, th I think you're gonna see the city double down on these efforts. Um, I certainly hope so, because there's, there's the mayor seems to be motivated to do something about it. Yeah. Well, thank you for the update. <laughs> So Lisa, have you seen anything like that in Boston? Um, so, um, I, 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 first I just wanna um, say that, that this reality that you're talking about, Cornelius, is, um, it is, is basically like the seed of, it's like the crux of the argument that we have with the city, right? The city says, we have, we forced the city to, to acknowledge that we have and both an affordable housing and a displacement crisis. So they, they say, yes, you're right, we do have that. The city's solution is to build 53,000 units, some per, small percentage of, of which will be affordable by, you know, a, a, a wide kind of, you know, range of, of affordability levels. Uh, everything from you know zero percent of area median income all the way up to one hundred and twenty percent of area median income. Okay, so so in and of itself that that's problematic. But the the strategy you know the, the, um, to say that you're going to you're going to intervene in a displacement crisis by building new housing, which we won't see for two, three, four years down the road doesn't make sense it just doesn't logically just that doesn't make sense and and that's all they got and that's all they got because this is a revenue problem for them they get money from and this is it's important that they get they, they get a percentage of affordable um, money either into a, a trust fund or actual um, affordable units based on you know uh, when, when luxury developers or market rate developers build um, build housing uh, where they need some kind of zoning variance and most housing in Boston needs some kind of zoning variance So, you know, that's how they get their revenue I, We get why they say that but that logically doesn't address the problem You need acquisition strategies as Cornelius alluded to which um, we fought for and there actually is a pot of money uh, for the city to subsidize no nonprofit developers or for-profit developers who are, are intentionally creating long-term, permanently affordable housing. Um, so that this is a long-winded way of saying no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would I would emphasize also that you know in in my view of these things over time, there's no way you can build your way out of a housing crisis. There's no way. <laughs> there's no way the taxpayer can can foot the bill. Um, there's no way to preserve, um, you know, just talk about working class communities. Um, you can't build working class housing with the free market. It's right. the free market has never built working class housing. Um, the only time it's built is when there's a massive subsidy involved. Um, the biggest housing subsidy program was for working people. It was, it's suburbia. It's, it's, all of the sprawl around every city in America. Some cities are just sprawl. They have no traditional urban core like Boston, like Houston. Um, and all of that housing was built for working people at a massive subsidy. The federal government subsidized the mortgage. The federal government paid for all the freeways to allow people to access cheap land. And then industrial building techniques um, reduced the cost of producing a unit um, to very low amounts where people could actually go in and buy a house. So there is no equivalent to that for the urban working class. There's nothing even close to that amount of spending going on. Um, so really you're talking about if there's a crisis, there, 
you know, there has to be a legislative, even a temporary legislative fix. Um, and if it's not rent control, if it's not a ban on no cause eviction, um, then you look very carefully. I would say look very carefully at what Portland passed, which is a relocation fee that says if your tenants cannot withstand, you know, being evicted in 30 days or um, withstand a, a 10% or more rent increase, then you got to pay to move them. Um, and that's a way around the statewide ban. We have a statewide ban on rent control. We have a state, we have a, you know, a no cause eviction law that cannot be overturned anytime soon. And, and this law, the relocation fee is a complete workaround that and rents are cooling down. The woman that I mentioned before, who's propelled to city council by street protests and the anger over the housing crisis, her name is Chloe Udaly. And she's the renter. She's a, the first renter to be on Portland City Council in a hundred, and since they've been keeping records on who's sitting on city council. And she got a 9.99% rent increase this year. And I think you had a question. I did it. Actually, um, you all have started to answer it. I wanna thank you for um, sharing so much with us today. And my question was, and uh, Cornelius has just started to answer it between displacement and right of return, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're moving two or three towns over and having to build a life there, mm -hmm. right of return can't matter if you can't return because now you've got your kids there or you got fired and you had to find a new job and right, et cetera. And so I'm wondering what other kinds of strategies like relocation fees, um, while while dealing with the crisis and trying to end the crisis, right? The long term goal, the the immediate goals of what do we do when folks are displaced? So relocation fees. What other if we were able to get right the no eviction, the no cause evictions, right of return, relocation fees? What other kind of structures yep. can yep. sustain that moment? And I'm thinking in part because Boston, as we know, right, public transportation is really bad here. And so, for example, you know, a mother, a single parent, a single mother, right, it's usually women, um, with a child who gets moved to a shelter in Waltham, right, yes. who can't afford the commuter rail to get back into Boston, which still takes a long time, now has a two and a two and a half hour commute in to get the kids into school by seven, to get to work or to get to one of the programs in order to keep you on public assistance, right? And if you're late too many times, they can kick you out. And this is the cycle That's great. that you were talking about. And so I'm wondering um, what other kinds of ways can those stop gaps, if you will, in yes. this moment. So, so I'm gonna let Cornelius have the last word. Um, and and I, I wanna highlight that, that Boston and Portland, um, although we, we share obviously similarities, you know, robust tenant you know, rights movements, et cetera, there, we are, we, there, there are some things that we don't share. Um, it, uh, you know, the, our, our housing market is, is at a different place in Boston, I think, than it is at, at, in Portland. Um, you know, we're, we're with, without trying to sound too hyperbolic, I do think that Boston is, is very, like, we're on the verge of, you know, being like a place like San Francisco, where it doesn't matter if you have a housing voucher anymore. It does, you, nobody with a Section 8 can afford to live in San Francisco. We don't want to get there but we are literally in a battle for our lives, for our city, with big real estate developers and investors that have short-term interests, right? They're trying to make a quick buck now while the market is hot. You know, they've got other plans for when our market changes, like maybe in a few years. But for right now, this is a land grab. This is a building grab. This is a build, build, build while you can what, well, you can flip and make a bunch of money. And because of that, developers and, and these corporate landlords are actually, able, are actually willing to, to, um, to provide very generous move out um, sums of money to, to folks who are in struggle. We have a, a building right now 
where where the, the offer started at $35,000 per household to move out. And then, and then the offer went up to $67,000 per unit to move out. So I, I, just, I just want you to, to, to see like a relocation subsidy is something that our developers would jump on because they just want that land. They really just want that housing. So that's not, in our opinion, that's not a, a viable solution for Boston right now, although obviously it is for a place like Portland. Um, so we say because we are in this life or death struggle, we need policies that make it so that people do not move in the first place. So, um, so there's a so th so there is this one example. I'll just give you one example. We're part of a coalition that has created um, um, a proposed change to Boston zoning code that would establish for the first time something called an anti-displacement zone. And, and, and a neighborhood designated as an anti-displacement zone would have enhanced tenant protections, enhanced protections um, around transportation, and also enhanced um, uh, labor and workforce protections to keep people who are, to, to keep people in neighborhoods that are at risk of displacement because of new transit or new luxury development in their neighborhoods, and it's a set of comprehensive policies meant to keep people there. One of those policies is actually something like a, a right to return. It's a, if you are in danger of being displaced and there's new affordable housing being created right now in your neighborhood, then you would have preference uh, to be able to, to go into that new affordable housing. That's one of many provisions. That's the first time something like that has ever been attempted in Boston because if you don't do it right, it could run afoul of, of fair housing law, actually. Um, but we figured out how to do it, and it's, it's one of, of many things that we're working with the city on right now. Thank Yeah, that's, that's interesting. We, we actually do have that problem with, um, with the relocation fee as well as developers on some properties. Um, offer more money than the relocation fee would require. So it is a matter of, you know, with any kind of punitive thing, it's like um, you have to make sure that the, the punitive fee is higher than the cost of doing business. Right. So, so it, it's, a constant, it's a constant moving target because nobody knows what direction this, this housing crisis is going to head in. Um, so so I, I i'm it's really interesting about the um, about the zoning thing you have inclusionary zoning in boston as well it's, it's i'm not sure it's been effective yeah it's, it's way too low the percentages are way too low yeah and, and so it's it's a matter i mean one thing is that you constantly have to readjust these policies you know our inclusionary zoning is very new but it hasn't been terribly effective um and that could be because the market conditions aren't right or because the 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 regulations aren't right um so I, so one thing is to constantly be revising these things and constantly like there is no solution there's just a process of of just attacking the problem ceaselessly uh, endlessly um i think another thing that i don't know if it has been done but does boston have eminent domain still um, so not, there's currently no um, non-government entity that has eminent domain powers, but yes, the city itself does have eminent domain powers. So another thing is eminent domain for, you know, for affordable housing. I mean, I think that's kind of like one of the last cards in the, in the taxpayer or the pub, you know, public's mm. um, deck. And, um, you know, looking at there's a, a big think tank report on social housing a european model where there's a mixed where the city basically finances a mixture of of for-profit housing that also subsidizes affordable units so it's it's sort of ingrained in a business model um that hasn't been tried in the u.s and so social housing is something that you could look into and if you couple it with eminent domain um you know, it, it's about land, obviously, and it's about money. Uh, and so, it, it, you know, even regulations, uh, you know, can be worked around. So th those are those are two ideas. Thank you. I've got one final question um, that we're gonna that we're gonna do, um, and then we'll 
kind of end because it's getting a little bit late. Um, and so last week was the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Um, and so can you um, reflect quickly on the importance of this act um, and the continued fight for housing equity in the United States? Um, and then um, kind of how, you know, how does anti-displacement movements sort of fit in the vision for fair housing for today? So. Um, you know, the Fair Housing Act was, you know, absolutely vital, crucial in breaking up, redlining uh, a policy that the government created, but that was kept in place for, you know, generations after the Fair Housing Act, just perpetuated by the banking industry, the mortgage industry, um, and, and local municipalities, and, and just then the force of cultural momentum behind it. Um, you know, a, a country of 300 million people doesn't change on a dime. Uh, so laws don't, aren't, you know, light switches that, that once you flip them, everything's all good. Um, and so the Fair Housing Act was a good start. It, it's been, it's been diminished and watered down. Uh, recently, there was a, a a good story called Pushed Out, a series by Reveal, the Center for Investigative Journalism, about the persistence of redlining, especially in the South and in Philadelphia, um, that the, the amount of rigor that, that the federal government now applies to lenders to check whether they are uh, uh, still practicing housing discrimination and lending, um, that rigor has declined uh, significantly over the generations. Uh, and so getting a federal government back into place that will scrutinize the banking industry um, is vitally important. I mean, it all comes down to elections, winning elections, and, and activism and resistance are important, but you have to ultimately get your hands on the levers of power at the highest level if you want to see things change in a big way. Um, and, and, and lastly, as far as fair housing, and as far as like the last question, the previous question, you know, the, the market isn't necessarily the enemy all the time. I, I think it, it is the enemy at the moment. Um, but like the example I, I brought up with how the suburbs were financed, um, despite all the racial discrimination that were inherent to suburban suburbanization of America, it did represent kind of a joining of private industry and public subsidy in a way that, that produced a lot of housing. And it, we don't have that right now in urban housing. There isn't a, a, a cooperation that works for working people. And, and I think that we should, we should make that a goal is to find that, to find some sort of sweet spot between private industry getting what they want and the public getting what it needs. Uh, and, I, and I hope we can find that because that would be sustainable. So, so maybe you'll do a part two um, because um, that, is a, that, 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 that is an entirely different panel discussion with lots and lots and lots more people. Um, I, I do, I, I do want to say that, um, you know, not all markets are bad. Socialized markets are great, I think, in theory. Um, the, 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 the kind of public-private partnership that you're talking about, Cornelius, was only able to happen because, because it was racialized. There's, with, without, uh, there's, there's no way that the country would have been able to lift all working class people up at without the, that rigid racial hierarchy in place. In other words, you needed to extract the labor of certain groups of people in order to, to have enough both in this country and across the and across the world, right? Like white workers were based were benefiting from the spoils of, of imperialism. So I mean and this this is a larger conversation, but I, 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 I caution us to talk to to not talk about class essentialized. Class and race and gender are intricately intertwined. Um, otherwise, we, you know, I, I, and, and I think that, I think that um, 
doing that allows us to craft better policy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so a friendly disagreement there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes. Well, I think we can also kind of end on this friendly disagreement note. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for so And welcome back into Priced Out the Podcast. I'm Andrew Morgan. And of course, Cornelia Sword, you've done a really great job uh, once again. And I love this, the Q&As. Uh, tell me a little bit more about Boston. Well, you know, as we can we can see or hear from the from the conversation Boston really doesn't have its arms around this issue even though it's been a really expensive city for as long as I can remember I went to school in Boston at Boston University for two years and there was as a student there was really only one place I could live which was Alston and at that time it, it was expensive for just about everybody it was still it was a really like kind of upper middle class city at that time there were affordable neighborhoods in Dorchester and Roxbury, and now that's you know of course where you're seeing the gentrification hitting the hardest, as well as in the in the kind of working class suburbs, um, which is you know the communities that we talked about here today. Schools love to screen uh, priced out as well as Northeast Passage, and, and you're preparing a DVD. So can you talk a little bit about that? That is a, a great thing to bring up because we are in fact about to release our educational DVD. It's um. It's a two-film DVD. You'll be able to see Priced Out and Northeast Passage on the same DVD. And there will be uh, filmmakers' commentaries that you can play for the first film, closed captions. And this is a DVD we're releasing, which is for educational institutional users really only. And then next year, we'll just be kind of rolling that, that type of product out. And uh, so those are three-year licenses and lifetime licenses and we also have a, a Vimeo paid unlimited viewing for one year license which goes for about a hundred dollars so mostly for institutions unless you're like the biggest priced out fan in the world then the streaming option is the one for you all right so what do we got coming up for them next on priced out the podcast so the next one is going to be a conversation between three filmmakers myself Sika Stanton and Nicole McDonald uh, talking about filmmakers covering gentrification, how you portray a community in a film. Sika Stanton, who worked on Priced Out, teamed up with Donovan Smith, who also worked on Priced Out, and they produced a short film called The Numbers, which is about East Portland and how that area is beginning to gentrify, but it's really a kind of a meditation on just the flavor and feel of the community before it gets gentrified. It's a really lovely, lovely piece. And Nicole McDonald produced and directed a film called The Last Days of Chinatown, which is about gentrification in Detroit. We have a really interesting conversation that was moderated by Andrew Morgan. Wow, I've, I've heard good things about him. The beautiful, beautiful Andrew Morgan. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I try. So, and it was <laughs> you, done. You try to be beautiful? Yeah, I do every day. You're doing a so, good job. <laughs> All right. Is everyone thoroughly confused now? Should be. We didn't talk about the Avengers. What? <laughs> we didn't talk about talking about it. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the Avengers. Let's we, just we, keep it rolling. We just, we, and you can put it in this one, or you can put it in the next one. There's always like a little comic book com chatter. Yeah. Let's put it in the next one. That gives okay. you guys another reason to listen, because we're going to talk. We're going to have a really good discussion on the next one, moderated by myself and Cornelius, and, and we're going to have Avengers talk. Yeah, we'll talk All about right. Avengers. All right. We'll see you guys on the next Christ Out Podcast.